Today I'm going to speak to you about hearing, hearing loss, and the brain. So, you know, hearing is like the cornerstone of our humanity because it allows us to communicate and socialize, and that's really what people do. And <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, hearing loss occurs in a lot of people all over the world and across all ages. So in children, for instance, it's, a, um, it's crucial for schooling. Uh, when uh, children learn to read, they look at the word, they hear the word, they repeat the word, and they have this feedback loop between looking at the word, saying the word, and hearing it properly said for them to learn to read. <clears throat> and once they learn to read, they can then read to learn. And that is really crucial for lifelong enjoyment of being able to negotiate a complex world. <clears throat> but hearing loss will impair language development, cognitive development, and as such will limit academic achievement. And so uh, we always have to be very cognizant of how well a children hears if we think a child is not learning properly. <clears throat> And if they, if, if they don't learn properly, they don't learn well, or if they're having trouble hearing, they're not going to be able to follow assignments, they're not going to be able to do what their teacher asks, and they're going to look like they're miscreants or mischievous. And so if they don't do well, that also limits options for access to university, and it will also limit uh, sort of job opportunities. <clears throat> so it's very crucial early on for children to have really good hearing. And for adults, we know that uh, hearing loss will impair or restrict uh, job opportunities or advancement, as well as career development. So in sort of every aspect of our sort of working, developing and working life, we need to have good hearing. <clears throat> in, uh, in the elderly, such as myself, and I guess many of you, uh, hearing loss uh, <coughs> creates a kind of, uh, it, it, impairs, it impairs our ability to socialize. Okay, so uh, like many of my friends avoid parties. Uh, they uh, don't go to restaurants because they're too noisy. And they dread family reunions because it's so noisy and they have trouble communicating. And so <clears throat> uh, individuals who are, who, are rec who are cognizant of their hearing loss but haven't really dealt with it other than withdrawing from challenging uh, auditory situations, start to become isolated. And social isolation uh, can lead to depression. And if uh, you do this withdrawal business, we know now from uh, other studies that uh, a socially isolated individual is five to seven times as likely to have early onset uh, cognitive loss or dementia. <clears throat> so th there are many reasons that we worry about hearing loss and, and what the impact is because uh, as I'm going to talk about it's sometimes difficult to detect that you have hearing loss. So you have a sense that you have hearing loss but you, you're oblivious or you're in denial. And, and so <clears throat> why do we care about this in a way is because uh, I think the statistics uh, Dr. Big showed some statistics. Um, I think uh, Sarah showed some statistics that something like three quarters of the population, at least in Australia, over the ages of 65 or 70, suffer significant hearing loss. Okay, and with our life expectancy exceeding 80 years, that means the last decade of our life will be spent with <coughs> a, a communication impairment. Okay, and, and, and so in the twilight of our lives, when we're supposed to be enjoying ourselves, we can't communicate. So we lose a bit of our humanity. And so to me, hearing is really an issue of quality of life. Not, it's not life threatening, but it really has to deal with how well we live. <coughs> so what I'm gonna do now is talk a little bit about sort of the aspects of hearing loss, but we need to know about sound, okay? So sound is just vibrations in air or vibrations in any medium. So if you're standing on the surface of the moon, there is no sound, okay? So if you can think of sound as if you take a tuning fork and you bang it on your hand, 
the tuning fork is going to vibrate, okay, this way. And when it goes this way, it's going to compress air. And when it goes this way, it's going to rarefy or create kind of a vacuum. And so as it goes back and forth, it, has a, it, it will go from rarefaction to condensation and back again. So you have each pair of rarefaction and, and uh, condensation is a cycle. And the number of cycles per second allows, is called frequency. And our perception of frequency is called pitch. Okay, so uh, a, high, a high frequency sound will have a high pitch, and a low frequency sound will have a low pitch. Okay, and what I've shown here is a piano yeah. keyboard, just to show you sort of the range uh, of hearing frequencies. Okay, so the lowest frequency on a piano is around 30 cycles per second, and the highest frequency is, I think, 4,200 cycles per second. Okay, so that's the range of piano, the piano keys, gives you a sense of, of that aspect of our hearing range. But really, good hearing goes quite high. It goes up to 20,000 cycles per second. And uh, in fact, if we had a good microphone looking at the frequency composition of my voice, it could, it could go up to 50,000 cycles per second. So even though we can only hear to 20,000, we are generating frequencies vastly uh, exceeding the, our range of hearing. So why do we care about frequency? Well, all sounds are made of frequencies, okay? And, and in a way that, uh, that rain sort of breaks uh, light into all the colors of the rainbow, the ear, the inner ear breaks all the vibrations in the air into the different frequencies, okay? And because frequencies compose all sounds, speech is simply a series of sounds of different frequencies strung together in time, okay? So <coughs> frequency is really important. E almost every aspect about how we perceive sound has to deal with the frequencies that compose it. So the verbs, or, or the uh, vowels, ah and e and u, they're very low frequencies. They vary in the, com the sort of composition of those frequencies. So we'll come back to frequency again. I want to go to the other two components of sound that are very important. And one of them is loudness, okay? Now we measure, in the lab, we measure loudness by the sound pressure level, okay? So uh, remember, uh, sound are vibrations in the air, and the force in which they propagate through air is our loudness. <coughs> and we hear over seven orders of magnitude in terms of loudness, from really soft whispers to jet engines. And we can make distinctions in loudness at all those different ranges. So if our hearing was any more sensitive, we'd be hearing the molecules of air bouncing around inside our ear, okay? So we have really exquisite hearing, really exquisite sensitivity. And in fact, that is part of the problem, is that because we're exposed to sounds of all levels of loudness, loud sounds can be damaging, okay? And th the danger of this is that it's kind of insidious. It's sort of like sunlight or radiation. Sh small exposures of, of sound, loud sounds, is not a big deal. But like radiation and like sunlight, exposure to loud sounds is cumulative. It, the, the, the system keeps track of how often we're exposed to loud sounds. And so eventually it catches up and loud sounds creates damage. And that, that damage means we lose our hearing or aspects of our hearing. And so it, what I'm gonna do is at some point I will show you later about what happens with, with noise damage. But the point of it all is, is we have to protect our hearing. And so for most of us in this room, it's sort of too late. We can still protect from further hearing, but what we need to do is try to educate our children and our grandchildren and our friends, the young people, because that's the future really for us is the young people. And they have to know that if they damage their hearing, they're gonna have, they'll suffer later. And the last part about sound, which is really important, is timing, okay? So sound has a time of onset, it has a time of offset, it has a time of duration. And we use the timing of sounds 
like in the Morse code, right, the International Morse Code. We use it to know melodies and music, and it's used in language, how we converse in language. And everyone in this audience probably recognizes I speak with a foreign language, okay? So uh, I speak with an American accent, not an Australian accent. So we're well aware of the fact that there are going to be times when I'm speaking and I'll pronounce a word differently than it's pronounced in, in English English or Australian English. And so you might miss the word just because the accent's in the wrong place. Okay. And that brings us to another part about hearing is that we guess what the words are in context. So we're really good at guessing. So even when we're starting to lose hearing, we can sort of fake it. All right, it, because language has a context. So why the, what does the brain do? The brain takes these vibrations in air and looks at it in, in terms of frequency, timing, and loudness, and processes that into sort of perceptual recognitions of events in our acoustic environment. So the first thing that happens is we have to detect it. We detect that sound, and that has to do with the sensitivity of our hearing. Once we detect the sound, a whole lot of processes kick in in the brain. We want to know where that sound came from, so we try to localize it. We need two good ears to do sound localization because the sound, the sound right in front of us arrives at the two ears equal in loudness and equal in time. But as soon as the sound is off the midline, it reaches the near ear faster and louder and our brain is able to detect these very small changes in time and loudness to tell us where the sound is. Okay? So we need to localize that sound because that's how we know when a bus is coming if we're texting our grandson to say, don't do this. All right? So the, the beauty of sound and hearing is that we can do things without having to actually look at it. It warns us about the telephone. It tells us about buses. Uh, it, it, you know, when uh, vertebrates were evolving, uh, most mammals live at night. They're active at night when there's no light. So they have to be, in order to determine what's out there, they have to hear. Okay? It's thought that hearing evolved so that animals could know their way around uh, and be safe when there was no light or when the grass was too tall or if the trees were too dense. All right? So when we couldn't see, we, we heard. And, and that allowed us to distinguish between a potential mate, a potential source of food, or a, a potential predator. Okay, so in a sense, these components of, of sound, which are very basic, are converted by our brain into meaningful signals. So now let's look at parts of the nervous system that has to process this, because this is going to lead to what changes with hearing loss and why that's so important. So you've seen this figure before. It's basically a picture of a human ear. And you see the pinna sound, the vibrations in air come into, are collected by the pinna, which is the external ear, and funneled into the tympanic membrane or eardrum by the ear canal. And uh, Dr. Biggs had talked about how the tympanic membrane and the three middle, middle ear bones serve as an amplifier to take those vibrations in air and transmit them into vibrations in the inner ear. So we're going to pick out, we're going to pick off this bone around the uh, cochlea and look down on top of the, what's in the inner ear. And this is an electron micrograph looking into the inner ear, but it's magnified maybe 30,000 times. Okay, and you can see that it's spiraled. And the working part of the inner ear is an is a elastic membrane upon which sit four rows of sensory receptors. And one row is especially important for how we perceive hearing. And this elastic membrane has differential malleability so that it resonates in harmony to the sounds that come into it. Remember I said it's a frequency analyzer. And so what happens is low frequencies are, are the membrane <coughs> vibrates in one place, high frequencies it vibrates in another place. And the vibrations uh, stimulate the tops of these stairs. So if we look here at this, in this box, 
we can now see blown up the three rows of outer hair cells and one row of inner hair cells. And they're called hair cells because these little hairs stick out of the tops of the cells. And they're the ones that get perturbed during mechanical vibration. And that causes the signals in the inner ear, the, these receptor cells, to be transmitted to the neurons. Okay? So now let's look at, these are just the tops of the hair cells, all right? So we're just, it's like we're looking down on tops of the rows, like we're looking at the tops of the heads of soldiers, three rows of, in the, of outers and one row of inners. And if we look at them from the side, okay, so here are the, the tips, which are these, the hair cells. Here are the inner hair cells, okay. So they're roughly nine to 12,000 of these sensory receptors spread across the basilar membrane. And these are the ones that we want to focus on because these are the ones that con con convey uh, vibrations in air into neural signals. And these green fibers, fibers in green, are the ones that convey the information into the brain. Okay? Now, what happens when you expose yourself to really, really loud sounds? Okay, so if we look at a normal hearing ear, the cells are very orderly. Okay, it's, it's the way you want them to look. Okay, so the, the three rows of outer hair cells or one row of inner hair cells are quite nice. And here's what it looks like if you expose yourself to a whole lot of loud sounds. Okay, so this individual, look how disorganized the sensory receptors are. Okay, this person has significant hearing loss. Now, one of the things that, that we have to recognize is the way so a permissible exposure to sound is measured. And it, what it means is, if, if we expose ourselves to really loud sounds, our head sort of feels like it's swollen, everything is, thing sounds muffled, and we go to bed, we wake up the next morning and it's okay again. We can, we can start to hear, we can detect the same sounds we did before. And if, actually, if we test the hearing by presenting uh, tones in quiet, the sensitivity to tones in quiet are the same. Okay. <clears throat> now I would maintain that hearing tones in quiet is not an adequate test. All right. It's sort of like uh, if you had this, you're testing vision. You can you can flash up something like that, and you can say, "Do you see it?" And someone with even with pretty poor vision would say, "Yes." If you have really good vision, you would see it and you could read everything and you would recognize the difference between some, some, some of the fine details in the print. Likewise with hearing, detection is different from sort of detailed understanding of, of the, the sound. So <clears throat> what we have here then is the top of an inner ear that has been subject to loud sounds for two hours. Okay. The animals, this is, these were done in animals, the animals have temporary threshold shift because that means immediately after they've been exposed to these loud sounds, it takes a much louder sound to get them to react. Okay? And if you look at the tips, the tips of the hair cells and the hair cells themselves all look normal. Okay? So, <coughs> what we have here then are the cells and, and we've, the, the nuclei here are dyed red. Okay? Here, are the, here are the hair cells. Now, if we go the next day and look here, okay, these, the round red globes are the nuclei of the inner hair cells. We're just dealing with the inner hair cells now, these. The green are the fibers, and so you can see these little red dots, okay. The little red dots are right here, and the red dots indicate the functional contact between the receptor cell and the nerve cell, okay. Each nerve cell has one, only one, functional contact. And this is, this is the same thing with the, the green eliminated. So you can see that each, this nucleus, so the cell body is going to look like this, sort of like here, right? So here's the hair cell outline, here's the nucleus, and all these dots are where there's a functional contact between the, the receptor cell and the nerve cell. Okay, now if we look over here, this is an animal that's had temporary threshold shift, but the thresholds have come back. Okay, so now if you test their sensitivity, 
the sensitivity is normal. But look what's happened. The functional contacts have been, 50% of them are lost, okay? That means in the, you, can, you can expose yourself to this kind of damage in two hours at a noisy club, okay? Or if you go to a, a football game and you're sitting underneath the, the roof and it's very noisy. So in two hours, you can not kill 50% of the functional contacts between your receptors and your brain. And that's really, really bad. Even though the sensitivity, meaning I can detect that sound, is back to normal. So, <coughs> so now let's look at how we want to think about this. Okay, so why, how does that work? How is it that you can damage your ears, or, or you, don't, you don't know if you've damaged your ears, but you can lose half your synapses and still have normal thresholds. Okay. So it's something like this. Here we have just a cutaway section of the inner ear. Okay. The inner ear is about 25 to 30 centimeters long, and this is just a little short piece of it. And you can see that each hair cell, like we've shown before, has about 20 functional contacts. And so we th this is what gives us high definition auditory uh, reception, okay? It's really important. It's sort of like high definition TV. It's a, what allows us to hear with great detail, okay? We can pick out a flute in a symphonic performance and we can distinguish that flute f uh, from an oboe. Okay, these are the kinds of details that, that normal hearing allows us to have. And it's sort of like this. Here are the channels from one hair cell, one receptor cell, going into the brain, okay? And so we have 3,000 of these receptor cells times 20. And that's how much input is coming into our brain as we're developing. And it allows us to have, as I said, high definition hearing, just like this would be high definition vision. Okay? It's iconic, we know what this is, but we can also see that there are people in the background, we see their clouds, we see maybe there's a boat in the background. So this, gives it, this is what sort of tells us what high definition vision would be. <coughs> With hearing loss, when, when you lose the, the functional contacts between the sensory receptors and the nerve fibers, the nerve fibers start to die. Okay? The sensory receptors will stay, but the nerve fibers die. And that means you don't have as much input coming. Okay? It's like now your auditory field has been pixelated. Okay? So something like this, the opera house is iconic. So we, even with a degraded vision, you can see, you can recognize that as, as the opera house. But what you can't see if there are people out in front, if there's a long line or no line, if there's a sailboat over here, if there are clouds. So, yes, you, you can see that, but you don't know a lot of the details. And sound is like that too. As, our, as we lose the functional contacts in our inner ear, our acoustic environment pixelates, we lose detail. We can hear things, but not with the same kinds of clarity. We can't make the same kinds of distinctions. So what happens with hearing loss? So hearing loss, it, it impairs our ability to distinguish signals and noise, okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. It creates sort of loudness distortions, okay? And <coughs> it creates sort of phantom sounds. So the brain doesn't like a vacuum. And so when you lose hearing, uh, Rather than the, the brain doesn't seem to want a spot where there's no sound coming in, so it starts to create it. Because normally, in, our, in the normal functioning ear, there is a lot of activity, even in the absence of sound. The auditory nerve is highly active. The auditory system is probably one of the most active systems in the brain, even in silence. Okay, so when, there, when you damage part of your, your ear, 
so that you don't get input from that segment of the ear, the, uh, the brain will create a sound that fills that space. And that is why with tinnitus, many times you can, you can match the, per, the, the pitch of the tinnitus to the site of damage. Okay, because that's sort of where the brain fills it in. But you can also have phantom sounds which are very complicated, like brass bands. Okay, so we know then that the, the ver just pitch matching can be done very low in the brain, but something like hearing or hallucinating false phantom sounds is coming from very much higher ordered or, uh, structures in the brain, the cortex most likely. So what happens in the brain? Okay, so this is just sort of a, a diagram on the left of a, of a normal hearing mouse brain, okay? And here's the auditory nerve fibers coming in. And as quick glance, you can see it's very organized, okay? It's highly organized, and it's organized for a reason, because it's frequency organized. And so much like the, the keys of a piano, you have high frequencies up here, and you go progressively in this direction, the frequencies are lower. And it's very orderly, so that the, you could, it's almost like you could go to different floors of a high rise and hear different frequencies, okay? So it's very orderly. That means when these fibers are active, they're transmitting their frequency information to the next cells in line in a very highly organized way, <coughs> okay? Now, with hearing loss over here on the right, you see two things. You see that, one, the density of the innervation is down because you've killed some of the, some of the ganglion cells, some of the auditory nerve fibers have been killed. But the other thing that happens, and we don't know why this is, the auditory nerve fibers are not nearly as orderly. They kind of stray. And, and we, we're trying to understand why the fibers move to different places. It's subtle, but you can see that they're moving. So it's like if you were to play a, a piece on the piano and every time you hit middle C, it actually played D flat. You, you can imagine how that was going to, how, how that's going to affect, one, your perception of the musical piece. But if, if someone is speaking to you, you understand why the, 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 the speech will be slightly distorted. And depending on how badly the hearing loss is will depend on how distorted this, the speech will be, okay? So you get, you get less input and it's slightly off. So the pitch will be slightly off because it's as if the mailman's delivering all your mail to the next door neighbor, okay? <laughs> and, and so you, you, un, you can start to understand why it's a little weird and why sometimes hearing aids don't always solve the problem or cochlear implants. Some, some of these assisted devices uh, are meant, are sort of designed after a f an intact ear. For instance, I actually wore a hearing aid for a, uh, about a week because I just wanted to know what it was like. I don't have a serious hearing loss. I have a little notch. And uh, it was actually fine. And the reason it was fine, I think, a little bit louder. My wife liked it because she said I didn't say what as much to her. <laughs> but in fact, the, uh, because I didn't have enough hearing loss, my brain was still, the, the, the information was being delivered to the proper addresses still. But the other thing that happens is on the tips of all these auditory nerve fibers are these very large endings. So one or two endings will like encompass a cell completely and it's considered a foolproof, 100% high fidelity contact, so that whatever is in this, this ending is transmitted with 100% fidelity to the next cell in line. So what happens with hearing loss? With hearing loss, here are some of these normal looking uh, endings, but if you look at a mouse with hearing loss, they're atrophic. They look more fatigued and tired, they have less branches, they have less going for them, okay? And so we expect them to have more failures. They're gonna be delayed. So one of the, th you know, imagine watching a movie where the sound is out of sync with the lips, all right? We've all had that. It's really annoying because you can't quite figure out what's going on. So if there's, if the sound is 
sort of disconnected from the acoustic event, you, you sort of lose track of what is what. Okay, so you don't want to have this, this sort of dissociation between uh, what is going on in the world and what you, the brain is actually perceiving. So now you, with hearing loss, you have, you've created a situation where the, you're not going to get 100% fidelity. So not only is it a little bit sloppier, the system is a little bit sloppier, but it's in making wrong uh, sort of deliveries, but now it's going to be, it's going to be a day late. Not only will it be go the wrong place, but it will be delayed. And so you can start to think, oh man, it is, it's really annoying. So as we lose hearing, these are the kinds of, of, of dilemmas that we see, okay? Now the other thing is, we think about <coughs> the nervous system always being driven by excitation. Okay, and that's true in many respects because if you touch the skin, the area under the skin will become more, the neurons under the, that we touch will become more active. And the, the intensity of the stimulus usually will mean the, the activity rate of the stimulated neurons will go up. But remember I said the auditory system is really active all the time, even in silence. So there's inhibition, inhibition to keep the sound down. And because we hear over such a wide range of, of loudness, the system would be running at full blast all the time if we didn't have a system to, to bring the, the activity down. So there's a lot of inhibition in the auditory system. With hearing loss, these inhibitory circuits change. They go, some of them go away, and some of them get less effective. And the reason is this, this brain doesn't need as much inhibition if the amount of information coming in is lower. So it's sort of a natural sort of compensation, a compensatory reaction that the brain has to lowered input. But what does that mean? It means that with inhibition going away, we have what is called a release of inhibition. And that means even more spontaneous activity will occur in the absence of sound. And we think some of this spontaneous activity is abnormal and it re may represent some forms of tinnitus. Okay? So we think then <coughs> with, oh, the other thing that's kind of interesting is we see these phenomena in the brain with congenital deafness and we see it a little bit with acquired deafness. So a congenital deafness is where you're born deaf and acquired deafness is where you, for whatever reason, disease, drugs, head trauma, um, uh, loud noise, c causes progressive hearing loss, and so you acquire the deafness over your lifetime. With congenital deafness, if you give uh, an animal, a, a young kitten, with congenital deafness, a cochlear implant, and so you start stimulating its, its ears when it's still very young, you can, you can reverse these kinds of changes that I've been describing. So it's almost like you can restore the system to its normal set point if you give an animal that doesn't hear something that allows them to hear. And, but if you give this uh, cochlear implant too late, so they've been deaf too long, and it's after puberty, it, it doesn't work. You cannot restore these changes that are created by hearing loss or deafness. So there's a time frame for fixing the ear. <coughs> so, what can, what can we say? We know that, for instance, that we can restore a lot of the structure of the brain with congenital deafness if we give this individual with a hearing loss uh, sound. Okay, so that means anyone here who thinks they might have a hearing loss <coughs> should go get checked because what we also know is if you correct your hearing loss early enough, you can probably, or at least this is our working hypothesis, prevent the continued deterioration of your hearing. Okay? So don't put it off. If you think you have a hearing loss, you need to get it tested. You need to get it checked. I think that's really important. We have a bunch of projects that are being funded by various and sundry sources that look at how we can restore the brain to its natural condition by preventing hearing loss. And we do that by putting these animals in, in, in amplified environments, 
to compensate for the hearing loss. Okay? And what else can we do? What can you do? You can alert your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your neighbors about the dangers of noise and about the importance of getting uh, your hearing tested periodically and if there's a hearing loss to have it attended to. Okay? And then I guess the last thing is nothing's as good as Mother Nature. So even if you have hearing loss and you go and have a hearing aid or an implant or, or any kind of assisted devices, it's never going to work as good as what you're born with. Okay? So that's the magic of biology and sort of the downside of losing hearing and having to rely on technology to make it work. But these devices still work really well. They just don't do everything. <coughs> so what are we going to do? Well, we do the same things we do anyway, is we try to educate the public. We warn them about hearing loss and the dangers of noise. I mean, for instance, I don't buy, I, won't, I don't own a Dyson vacuum cleaner because they're too noisy. I mean, I have a bunch of <coughs> apps in my, uh, in my phone that tests the loudness of hearing. So wherever I go, even if I'm in the movie house, I like crank open my iPhone. I, do I need to protect my hearing? Okay. I test the hearing wherever I am. It's, it's, my, my wife kind of goes, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I tell her, it's just because I want to hear you, dear. <laughs> okay. But you can test the loudness of these things, and, it's, and, and there's an awful lot of places where loudness is damaging. So when I'm grinding my coffee beans in the morning, I put the toaster cover over it, so then I grind it to reduce... <laughs> I know, I know. And to reduce the amount of noise. Okay, so every time, any time I can like reduce my exposure to noise, I do. I'm probably one of the few people who walk down the street and if a fire engine goes by, I cover my ears. Okay, you have to do this or you're going to suffer. Okay. <coughs> so, protect yourself. You protect your earing, hearing, warn others to do it. Um, and so, I guess, that's pretty much it. We're, we're trying to understand hearing loss, brain changes, and we're trying to figure out how, well, the easiest thing to do is to prevent hearing loss, and that's with public education. But short of that, there are devices and strategies to combat hearing loss, and I guess, so we're sort of working at both ends of that. And uh, that's it. Thank you.